Hey, let's, uh, hey. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> hey, before you sit down, before you sit down, I want to pray for us real quick. Um, God, we're excited, and uh, I'm excited to be back with my church family. And um, you've done a lot in me this summer. You've done a lot for me this summer, but there's um, something about home that we need, and uh, I need it, and that's what I feel today. And God, that song is why we're here, because all of us look at some aspect of our life, and it's a grave, and we need you to resurrect it, and we need you to plant something new and something good and grow something there, God. And that's why we worship you, because you're in the resurrection business. So thank you for home, thank you for the church, thank you for Mosaic, thank you for Jesus, thank you for the ability to worship, thank you for community, thank you for friends, uh, just thanks for this place, we love you, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen, y'all can have a seat. Y'all excited today? I can tell, hey, Ted Crew, I haven't had to ask this in a while, I need you to turn on those back lights so I can see everybody in the room today. Um, band, great job. Uh, thanks for leading us so well. Uh, I'm back. Yeah. It's good to see you all. I've missed you. And um, if you are a first time guest, this is not the Carl Fan Club, but I have been gone. I had a 100 day sabbatical where we, my family is out of the state. Uh, about 95 of those days, and I'm um, doing a bunch of stuff. I'll tell you more about that in a second. I have been, I have been walking around the office this week playing this song. Y'all remember that? Guess who's back, back, back again. Oh, yeah. Okay, you can cut that out. <laughs> They're like, easy, buddy. Uh, I haven't been in this room in four months, though. And we started this church 13 years ago. In fact, this Tuesday will be Mosaic's 13th birthday which I think means, I think means we're in puberty now as a church, so we've got armpit hair, we smell funny, we're learning to use deodorant, we're a little awkward, but we're going into man, it's going to be all good. Um, we did a lot of fun stuff this summer. A, a friend of mine, Jesse, who preached here uh, just recently, said, Carl, your sabbatical needs to come in three phases. It needs to be um, just fun, to just have a blast for a while. Then you need to spend some time listening to God, and then you need to do some dreaming and planning for the future. So I really took his advice, and we spent uh, the very beginning just doing our typical Florida family vacation, which was great. And then the six of us did a huge national parks trip, and we went all over out west, and it was unbelievable. In fact, just during that last worship song, singing about how great God was, I was just closing my eyes thinking of seeing the Milky Way galaxy at Arches Park, and... Um, hiking in a canyon at Zion and uh, me and my son being absolutely terrified of the hundred uh, of the thousand foot cliff next to us as we hiked up most of Angel's Landing but it was just awe inspiring and uh, I know that's going to come up in a ton of sermons so I won't spoil it all just now but that that was so uh, much fun then we got to go to Colorado for a month and uh, basically a friend of a friend so a new friend of mine um, God provided a free place for us to stay in the middle of nowhere in the Rocky Mountains, and it was just what I needed. And I don't know if this phrase makes sense, but um, if you've ever, what we were, if you've ever been a good board, that's what we were, where it was like, we have nothing to do today, and that's what we need, right? Some of you with toddlers are like, I have no idea what that means, ever. <laughs> I get it. You'll get there. Um, but it was just so great to wake up and, uh, and, and just have no agenda and be able to enjoy God's creation. My oldest son got me into mountain biking while we were out there, so I'm kind of a mountain biker now, and um, that was a lot of fun. In fact, one day, uh, me and two of my boys were biking along, and we, you know, we, we stopped so we can make sure we're all together. We look out over the pond next to us, and probably 50 yards away, there's, the, there's these two moose just grazing right there, and we're like... God, this is so awesome, <laughs> and it was just spectacular. Then our last day in Colorado, um, my son said, hey, we need to go to a downhill mountain biking park, or everybody in Maryland's going to think we totally missed uh, the opportunity here, so we went to 
um, trestle at Winter Park where you ride ski lifts up and bike down. And this was me at the beginning of the day. Pretty impressed with myself right there. But it went to my head because this was me at the end of the day. <laughs> and you're laughing, but you don't realize this bone is in four pieces right here, including one piece that they found out in surgery pierced a muscle. So that feels awesome right now. I'm not on Oxy right now, by the way. Um, and then uh, a, a, about a week later, it looked like this. And count them, seven screws in my shoulder. So if you are a hugger, I'm a hugger. I'd love to hug you after service, but just not right here, okay? <laughs> not, not this side. Um, but uh, I, I, I really did miss you. And you are, I, I speak for uh, my wife and my entire family, you make, the, you make Maryland home for us. You really do. We got to visit a couple really great churches on our sabbatical. And, you know, when, you're, uh, when you work in church and you drop your kids off at ministry, you interrogate them afterwards on, like, what they do that's better than Mosaic. I need to know so I can text our staff right now. And um, my kids... Uh, I hope they don't mind me saying this, would almost be in tears when we picked them up. And I'm like, man, this looks great. The volunteer's great. What, what, what's, so, what's so bad about this church? And uh, they said, we don't know anybody. And that was it. And they had like a great building and great volunteers and all that stuff, but when you know somebody is what makes it home. And um, my wife and I felt that too. You know, so we got to visit a couple great churches. And it was a good show, if you know what I mean. Um, but it wasn't home. And uh, so, so we, we really missed you all. Whoever occupies the seat I do gets a weight put on them that they don't ask for. It's just part of the thing. And it was really helpful to set that weight down for a few months. And our team did a great job carrying that, um, but I needed to set that down. And I told you all before we left, I'm tired. And I think the way I said it was, I'm tired. <laughs> Uh, and so people have been asking me, like, how, how you know, did it work? Are you, how are we doing? And um, I, I'll tell you, I'm rested. I really am. I'm physically rested, which was part of it. I just, I just feel ah, physically rested. And I feel my soul has rest. When we were in Colorado, the, the best, one of the best parts of my day, every day, was just waking up before 6 a.m. and um, getting some breakfast and having a little devotion, quiet time, not a little, a long devotion quiet time there next to this big window where I was looking at the Rocky Mountains and I just see the sun come up over the mountains every morning. I read a book on silence and solitude and try and practice some of that. But it was just a time to <sighs> rest. And it was really, really good. And then, uh, I, honestly, my mind is rested. People ask me, like, what's the best book you read? I said, honestly, I, I didn't read a lot on purpose. I mean, I read some sci-fi books, listened to some sci-fi books to make the driving go by. Um, I did read some theology books I'll be talking about probably in, in weeks to come, but I, I didn't read any leadership books because that's not what my soul needed. It's not what my mind needed. I just needed to breathe in every way, and I got that, so I, I just want to say thank you. We're starting a new series today that I think is going to help everybody from sixth grade through retirement age. And um, before I even really get into that, I, I want to say a couple things, not about me, but just kind of about other things since I've been gone. Um, here's one thing that's true, and you probably don't know this, you may not think about things like this, but in most churches out there, when the lead pastor takes a break, even if it's just a shortened, typical summer break, which I'll continue to take every summer, um, the church kind of just stops. It's like the B players are there, people don't come as often, and the church doesn't really have much momentum. And I was really excited that that didn't happen at Mosaic. Because this church isn't built on a personality, it's built on a person, and that person is Jesus. And so this, yeah, you should clap for that. And that was shown in Impact Week, and that was shown in middle school CIY, and in high school CIY, and that was shown in baptisms, and that was shown um, in many things, uh, in one of the things I care most passionately about for the long-term health of this church, it was shown in that the gospel was preached in helpful, practical ways every week. And we had great... People um, from guest speakers come in and preach the gospel well. We had uh, multiple staff members preach up here for the first time, and they did great. And then most of all, we had John really carry a strong load and do great. So,
So I'm going to take another sabbatical starting next week, and you guys are good. Uh, People ask me, the, the staff asked me, um, hey, what were you scared of? Oh, dear God, I just saw Steelers jerseys in here. We're still reaching the lost. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, where was I? The leadership team asked me, hey, like, what, what are you scared of coming back? You know, before they, like, told me how things had been. And I said, well, really, just two things. Um, I want to make sure it's church money is good. <laughs> And um, the staff's healthy, because either of those things going haywire will just, like, you know, take a lot of energy real quick. And they said, well, we're proud to let you know Mosaic's in the black for the year. People have overgiven. Our staff is underspent. Our staff is healthy. We still love each other. We're ready to follow you. Let's go. So it's like, awesome. Let's do this. Um, I did visit 24 states this summer, and Maryland loves masks more than any of them. Y'all, it was wild. Like, it's a different world out there. I'm telling you. And I'm not bashing you if you wear a mask. You wear whatever you want. In fact, as, as one of my, I kind of am saying this on purpose because um, here's why I bring up the mask thing. Because you need to be here. And a lot of you are here today, so I don't need to tell you this. Um, but you need to be here. And I hope I'm wrong about my next statement. But it looks like COVID's not going away. Like, maybe ever right? And I hope I'm wrong about that, but I'll tell you what one of my pastor friends said. I don't care if you wear a hazmat suit. Just do what you got to do to be here. And the reason is ministry is incarnational. God is incarnational. That's a big theological word that just means it has flesh on it. When God said, I want to teach and save and love my people, he didn't send us a message. He came with flesh on. Ministry is incarnational. Scott Nickel, who preached back here in the spring, I already talked to him. I said, Scott, you're coming back. He said, I will. Uh, He said in another sermon he didn't preach here, he said, I just had a friend go through the worst tragedy you can possibly imagine, but he said, there's a reason I didn't watch the funeral online and send him a DM. There's a reason I got on a plane, traveled over a thousand miles. It was so I could give him a hug. Ministry is incarnational. You need to be with people. And here's the thing. A lot of Christians, a lot of churches, we've talked about this, y'all, embrace either faith or wisdom because they seem to contradict in a lot of scenarios. But God commands us to have both faith and wisdom. So that means I can't just focus on, I'm going to do what it takes to grow me with God no matter what. It means we can't focus on, I'm just going to be safe from COVID no matter what. It means no, 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 no. If we're going to love God according to the scriptures, we're going to embrace both. And you need to be wise and you need to grow your faith. So being wise means you need to be safe and growing your faith means you need to do, do, if at all possible, whatever it takes so you can be here in person, so you can be in a group in person so you can serve in person because ministry is incarnational for the sake of your heart soul mind strength be here every week if you can i want to say something else i know i'm a couple weeks late on the news but it's still in the news i want to say something about afghanistan we like to pretend in our country that politics and church are separate they are a lot of the time but they're not I have friends and family members who've devoted themselves to Afghanistan. My mom, uh, nearly 20 years ago now, was on the first American medical missions team that was allowed in the country of Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban. And the fall of that country is not good for the mission of the church. What has happened in the world is not good for Christians. And that's what I care about. And the people I'm connected with there already have less electricity and less water than they did the month ago. Some of them are in in hiding because they fear they'll be executed. The latest reports that came out this week, if you've been following it still, is that Christians are hiding their daughters and have to pretend they don't have them because if the Taliban finds out a Christian and a Christian only has a daughter, they come take her. You will never see her again. And if you resist, you are executed and then they take her. That's real. The fall of that country is not good for the mission of the church. So I um, wore my shirt today 
I love this shirt for many reasons. Uh, to honor our military who worked so long and so hard to provide a safe place there for the people of God to be able to freely do the work of God. And some of them lost their lives for that. And I get it, politics is messy and war is hard, but I am sad about what has happened. And somebody said, well, Carl, aren't you worried about somebody at Mosaic being offended about your shirt? No, it's free country. You can be offended if you want. But that's what I love about it is that when someone is offended by the flag, it kind of, I don't understand it, but it kind of makes me smile because they're actually showing why I appreciate the flag and why this flag, what this flag represents is so great because this flag represents an environment in which you are free to not like it and criticize it openly without being afraid for your life, which is what happens in other countries like Afghanistan. And what this, yeah... So I want to say um, two quick more things about Afghanistan. Um, Afghanistan needs to be a stark reminder for all of us that we need to be thankful for our freedom, thankful for our rights, and thankful for an environment, meaning a country, where we are free to proclaim what God says in this book. And I'm not worried about government officials coming in this building right now and shutting my microphone off. And... And it needs to be a reminder to us that we will stand before God one day and give an account for what we did with that freedom. I don't know how God holds people account who have to hide their daughters and pretend they don't know them. They don't have them. But I have some ideas of how he holds us accountable who can say whatever we want whenever we want. So we need to remember that. I'm back. <laughs> Uh, one more, yeah. Uh, uh, and one more thing with that, because we can't, we can't just sit here and talk, right, about Afghanistan. Oh, it stinks what's going on in Afghanistan. We can't just talk. Um, we have brothers and sisters in Christ who are hurting right now, so we reached out to the organization we're most familiar with that we had not previously partnered with, and we don't necessarily have a long-term goal to partner with them, we'll see. But we said, hey, we can't sit by while Afghanistan has just been declared the number one most persecuted country in the world for Christians. Here is $10,000 from the people of Mosaic for your emergency relief fund to support those Christians right now. So you all gave that this week. Good job. And if you don't give at Mosaic, you can start giving today and say you're still a part of that. We'll just let that go. Um, <laughs> somebody asked, did you get any big revelations while you were gone? And I didn't get any, like, new revelations. Like, there wasn't, there wasn't some new epiphany or something. I did get some clarity on some old things that matter that the clutter of life just wouldn't let me see. And I'm really going to unpack those in future weeks. I'm not going to really get into those. But if you're new or if you're old and just need reminding, um, let me just remind you that we're going to double down on who we are and what we believe. And here's what that means. We believe Jesus is the Son of God. We believe the Bible is his word, and it has to get in us and through us and penetrate our heart, soul, mind, strength. We believe that what God teaches is the best way for every human who ever lives to live. And that includes your gender, your sexuality, your money, your marriage, your work, your politics, your family life, all of it. If every person, whether you accept Jesus or not, just did what God teaches in the Bible, your life would get better. We believe we as a church have a unique calling to reach men to be the fathers, husbands, and men of God they're called to, believe, to be. We believe it's our job to spread the gospel worldwide, locally, and nationally through planting churches and doing missions worldwide. We're going to do this while we baptize more people than we've ever baptized in the history of this church because we believe that Jesus and Jesus alone saves, that you are destined for hell because of the sinful choices you have made, but God in his grace wants to save you from that. And when someone repents and is baptized, that is them coming home and crossing from death to life and we'll celebrate like that, like that like no other because that is the win of this church and it will be as long as I'm the pastor here. By the way, I got haircut while I was gone. I don't know if you noticed. You may not have noticed because the reason... <laughs> I see you, my man. Uh, <laughs> you may not have noticed because I knew it was time when in... Um, I think it was March, a buddy of mine who watches from out of state 
uh, texted me on a Monday morning. He said, Carl, I didn't know you shaved your head. And I texted back, I didn't. <laughs> so on sabbatical, you know, my, my marriage is high truth, high grace. So my wife looks at me and she goes, babe, it's time. <laughs> So uh, somebody said, you trying to be like Jim Bergen? I was like, no, this is the way I never wanted to be like Jim Bergen ever <laughs> in my life. Um, hey, one, one more quick thing. Uh, I accidentally skipped something um, that, that we added while we was gone. You can show this giving um, slide. Is, uh, you've always been able to give with a checking account or with um, a debit or credit. I know a lot of you are, like me, you're dabbling in cryptocurrency. So we may be the first church in the history of the world. You can give with cryptocurrency to Mosaic. <laughs> that is awesome. with that Litecoin tithed on right now. <laughs> anyway, I just think that's cool. <laughs> Been texting some of my crypto buddies. They're like, tell us how much comes in. This is totally awesome. <laughs> they said, well, Mosaic, just keep it in there and let Bitcoin go to a million. No, we're just going to, it just gets transaction we get when you give it. All right. Um, I want to pray and then <laughs> transition, kicking off this series. Let's pray. God, um, it is fun to be back. And... Um, I'll just take this moment, God, to pray for our brothers and sisters in the persecuted church. It happens in Afghanistan. It happens in other places. And it's, it, it, it's impossible, God. I mean, it, it seems literally impossible to not take for granted what we have. And uh, so in a weird way, God, I think you'll know what I mean. Thank you that our brothers and sisters are going through a hard time. So we're reminded what matters and how we need to follow their example. That when our kid gets on our nerves today, we think, well, at least nobody's going to bust through the door and take them. That as we listen to the scriptures today, we can think, thank you, God, that we can sit in an air-conditioned room with a party afterwards and do this. So, God, as we open your word, will you uh, teach us something good today? Because we're here so you can turn a grave into a garden. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I don't know uh, who on my team I'm talking to down here. I'm already way over time. You better let kids' ministry go. They got to come up with something else to keep. Yeah. Our kids' director's like, I can already tell. You, you got it. All right, here we go. Here's our scripture today. Genesis chapter 2. There, there's no slide for this. Just listen to this. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he placed the man he had made. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. Today we are starting a new series on work. When that comes to mind, what do you think? And if you're normal, I'll tell you this, because multiple surveys have been done, and about 80, no matter who does the survey, about 85% of Americans agree uh, that they dislike their jobs. And let me just remind you from the outset of this series, I'll probably remind you once or twice more as we go, but we treat students as young adults, not big kids. So those of you in 6th through 12th grade, when I say work, I mean school. That's your job. Well, those of you who are stay-at-home moms, I know we got some of those in the room, you know Stay-at-home mom is your work. They can't amen because they're out of energy, but they agree with me. <laughs> um, we all have work to do, but we struggle with work, right? We like having a nice phone. The problem is you're always reachable. John reference, like being able to stay at home and work is nice, but it means you're working at home. Where's the boundary between the two? Sometimes it feels like work doesn't pay enough. Sometimes we can't keep a job. Sometimes it just feels like slow torture. Sometimes the right job just always seems one promotion away, doesn't it? One way to think about work is this. If you found out this afternoon that a long-lost relative of yours died and unexpectedly left you $6 million, what would you do? Most people say the first thing they do is quit their job. They do. We spend 90,000 hours at work in our lives. My friend actually looked up some trivia about this. If you walk 90,000 steps, I know some of you are trying, right? Because you're always telling me how many steps you have that day. Uh, that's 45 miles you've walked. 
If you get in your car and drive 90,000 miles, which is what it felt like to my family did this summer, without stopping, uh, you would actually circle the globe three and a half times. Or here's some interesting stats just about how you spend your life because the average lifespan, um, if I did the math right, is 622,000 hours. After you deduct sleep, you have 394,000 hours. 394,000. So work is 22% of your waking life. And I want to compare that to a few different things. Um, How much time does the average person spend laughing? 3,600 hours. Unless they sit under my preaching, then it's a lot more. (laughs) (laughs) How much time will we spend exercising and taking care of ourselves physically? That's 4,300 hours. Now, some of you are bringing this average way up, and some of you... Eating, we spend 32,100 hours eating. Yo, I'm not sorry about it (laughs) because I'm doing this. Uh, What about this? How much time will we have have spent having sex in our life? 2,800 hours. Now, there's a joke here. But I have matured on my sabbatical, so I'm not going to say it. I actually just couldn't think of what joke wouldn't get me in trouble at home, so I'm just not going to touch it. Uh, What about time with family and friends? That's 42,000 hours. I was pretty proud of that, right? That sounds pretty good. But when we think of 90,000 hours, we got to make sure that we're doing this right. Is it life-giving? Is it what God wants you to do? Does it make enough money? Is it sucking your will to live? One quarter of your waking life is going to this. At the end of your life, will it matter? Will it have been fulfilling? Will it be something instead that you just endure? That's what we're going to talk about for the four weeks of this series. By the way, um, I sent this to my sermon review team, and one of them wrote in, hey, you forgot this one. On our phones, we spend 94,000 hours. (laughs) Which I was like, well, maybe we're not really working on those, and maybe this is just this, you know, with people next to... Anyway, I'll leave that rant for another time. (laughs) Today we're going to go through Genesis 1 through 3 in the Bible because it teaches some really important lessons about work. We're going to start in Genesis 2, skip around just a little bit. And if you remember, in Genesis 1, God creates the universe... Then he creates a unique place called the Garden of Eden. Then he creates man. Look at Genesis 2 again. Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. He breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, which wouldn't you like to be there? Don't you want an instant replay of this in heaven? Like, what does that look like? I don't know. (laughs) And the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, which again, I just want to see this. Like, did God just like snap his fingers? Boom, perfect garden. Does he enjoy gardening like some people? And he like actually took time to cultivate this plant and then he went over the next. I don't know. I want to know. Next verse, 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, and catch the phrase, to work it and keep it. And keep in mind, this is before sin entered the world. God gave Adam work to do. And this is the main lesson today. We're going to unpack it. It sounds hard to believe. Work is a gift. Work is a gift. Work is a gift. I want you to say that out loud on, uh, with me on the count of three. One, two, three, go. Work is a gift. And I know. I know, right? But remember, the source of our truth is not our experience It's not what the culture around us teaches. Our source of truth is God's word. And God gave Adam work to do before sin entered the world. And this is crucial for the Christian to understand. And some Christians will say, no, 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 no. no. Work, Carl, was the result of the curse of sin. It's part of the punishment of sin. No, it's not. Look at it. Because when God tells Satan and the man and the woman, hey, here's the natural results. Here's the curse of you disobeying me by eating what you weren't supposed to eat, here's what he says to the man. God said to the man, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, 
the ground is cursed because of you. All your life, you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It'll grow thorns and thistles for you. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat. The curse of sin wasn't work. The curse of sin was that work would be hard, that work would be tedious. So the way I read it is the curse isn't work. Curse is yard work. <laughs> but even go to Genesis 1. I want to show you how God creates the universe. Look at, show you a bunch of scriptures real quick. Uh, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Okay, you've heard that. Day four, God said, let lights appear in the sky to separate day from night. Day five, let the waters swarm with fish and other life. Let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. Day six, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. But then look at how the creation story wraps up. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was complete. On the seventh day, God had finished his, there it is, work of creation so he rested or he ceased from what his work god was at work before humans existed god gave adam work to do before sin entered the world and then i want to look ahead here because this will surprise some of you there's actually going to be work in heaven Revelation 22, no longer will there be any curse. That's good news. No more thorns and thistles. The curse is lifted forever. But check this out. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. Now think about this. What does serve mean? It doesn't mean sit around and do nothing. It means you're doing stuff. We will have tasks in heaven. And look at what Jesus says in John chapter 5. My Father is always working, and so am I. Work is a gift. Work is a gift. Work is a gift. Say it out loud. One, two, three, go. Work is a gift. So how are we getting this wrong? Because I sure as heck don't feel sometimes like work is a gift, right? Right? But Scripture teaches me work is a gift, school is a gift for four reasons I want to show you. And here's the deal. We're a church that takes notes, so why don't you get out the moleskin you brought to church with you and write these four things down, write the Scriptures we put with them, or if you don't have that, get out your phone, take pictures of these so you can look back at them later. Maybe even if you're a social media person, post them online, talk about the main lesson that's jumped out at you. Here's the first thing to write down. Work develops character. And that's not a fun one, right? Nobody's clapping at that. Yay! Paul writes in the New Testament, suffering develops perseverance. Perseverance develops character. And when I hear that, I know it's true, but that makes me not want character. I don't want to suffer. (laughs) But I do want character. When I was in college, my um, on-campus, one of my two college jobs was to work on campus as a landscaper. And the two worst times a year for that, two worst parts of the job, were the dog days of August and snowy days in the middle of winter. For this, these reasons, when it was really hot in the middle of August, sometimes when certain places that we tried to neglect needed to be trimmed, they were too steep for a lawnmower, they'd drop me off with a weed eater at the bottom of a humongous hill, and they'd say, hey, Carl, weed eat that entire hill, we'll see you at lunchtime, good luck. And I was left there in the humidity with the mosquitoes, with the long grass like scratching my legs, with bits of who knows what was burying that grass coming up and hitting me. It was rough. And in the winter, when there was a big snowstorm, every other student was hoping, I hope I don't get, have class tomorrow, I hope that's canceled. But all of us on the landscaping crew had to show up for work at 2 a.m. We'd show up in all our layers and gloves and hats and all that stuff. Then they'd send us out with shovels and on like the tractors and everything while the higher up people got to go in the nice warm cabs of the big trucks and we'd have to shovel all the sidewalks from 2 a.m. to 7 a.m. so when the students woke up they could walk to class no problem and it was cold and my hands were frozen in place and it felt like I was getting frostbite and I'm making eight bucks an hour on this job what the heck am I doing it was miserable but you know what I learned at that college that there's things you can't learn in a classroom or a book that you need to know to succeed in life, right? Those jobs taught me something that the classroom couldn't. So this means if work develops character, 
that sometimes when you get a job, it's not about having your dream job. When you're young, you've got to climb the ladder. When you're a teenager, you've got to get random part-time jobs. Sometimes it even means as an adult, the reason God will have you in a place at a certain time is just to develop character in you, which is tough because we want to change the world. We want to make a bunch of money. We want to use our gifts and talents. Sometimes God says, no, just character. That's it. Let me tell you something Christians believe about marriage and connect it to work. God is more concerned about your holiness than he is your happiness. And listen, this is like PhD level following Jesus right here. But think about this. If God was most concerned about your happiness, then when he sent his son to earth, he would have sent someone to take away all your suffering and pain. That's not what he did. He sent someone to die on the cross to take your sin on him, so you would be what? Holy in his sight. God is more concerned about your holiness than your happiness. This is why I have this conversation at least once a month outside after services. Somebody I know or don't know will come up to me and say, Carl, uh, my marriage is miserable. What does God want me to do? And the answer, with great compassion, is God wants you to stick it out to be a model of Christ to the church because there's lessons he wants to teach you right now that you cannot learn any other way. And there is a dependence on him that you will not get except going through this time. And that's hard. But listen, if this phrase is true in your work, it means that you will develop character. God is at work is more concerned about your holiness than your happiness, which means if you're stuck in a dead-end job, maybe God's just teaching you about something, where, uh, something about where true joy comes from. If you hate the subject students that you study in school, maybe, maybe God's trying to teach you that, hey, other people know more about what you need to know than you know about what you need to know. If you think you don't make enough in your job, maybe, I don't know, but maybe God is teaching you about who or what you really depend on. Work develops character. Second thing, reason work is a gift, work provides for those in need. I want to show you this verse that's just crazy intense. Look at this. First, First Timothy 5.8, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, so it starts with your household and then expands as you're able beyond that, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. <laughs> like, chill out, Paul. <laughs> if you don't provide your, for your family, you're worse than an unbeliever. How does that possibly make sense? I'll tell you why. Because it means you're not taking responsibility for your life. It means you expect free hand, handouts. It means you have a mindset that says you deserve for other people to do good things and provide for you, but the entire essence of Christianity is doing for, Jesus doing for you what you couldn't do for yourself and you accepting it as a free gift in spite of you knowing you didn't deserve it and you can't deserve it, any, anything from him whatsoever. That's why it's called grace. So if you go through life Paul says, thinking that you just deserve for everybody to do everything for you, then you don't even get what Jesus is all about. You're worse than an unbeliever. So it's a privilege to work to provide for people in need. And that verse doesn't say anything about if you can't work, if you're disabled, if you have a mental condition, if you have anything that prevents you from working. But it says if you can't work, if you can work and you don't, you're worse than an unbeliever. But work provides for those in need. I like this quote I read. Imagine that everyone quits working right now. You're like, I can imagine. <laughs> what happens? Civilized life quickly melts away. Food vanishes from the shelves. Gas dries up at the pumps. Streets are no longer patrolled. Communication and transportation services end. Utilities go dead. Those who survive at all are soon huddled around campfires, sleeping in caves, clothed in raw animal hides. The difference between a cave and culture is work. There may be no better way to love your neighbor, as Jesus commands us, whether you're writing parking tickets, software, or books, than to simply do your work. I did think he went a little overboard with talking about writing parking tickets. I mean, officers, come on. But 
This is why Proverbs 18 says this, a lazy person is as bad as someone who destroys things. What's that mean? Same thing the quote just said. If you don't work, if you're lazy, you're destroying the culture a lot of us are trying to create. Ephesians 4, let the thief no longer steal. Let him work. Do an honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Those of you who give to Mosaic, you work for that money, you give to Mosaic, you sent $10,000 to Afghanistan this week. Why? Because you work. If you don't work, you couldn't do that. Those in need that these verses talk about could be the poor, could be your own kids, could be paying off somebody's debt, definitely includes tithing. I talked to somebody who retired a few years ago, and he said, man, I'm really struggling with generosity. I said, wait, what do you mean you're struggling with generosity? You've always been one of the most generous people I know. He said, yeah, I've always given a percent and, and even beyond a tithe, but I have zero income right now, so a percent of zero is zero. I don't have any money to give. I don't know what to do about that. You know, it caused him some severe problems. And he told me how he kind of problem solved and found some unique ways to be generous, but it showed me he had lived this out his entire career. He had worked so that he could provide for those in need. Third reason, work is a gift. Write this down. Work is the best place to tell others, come and see. Jesus says, Matthew 28, go into all the world, make disciples, and baptize them. That's why we start new churches. That's why some of you need to go into professional ministry. That's why we support Christian nonprofits. But you know where most of us go into all the world? Work. At your job. Every day you go to the mission field. You, go to the, you work at NSA, mission field. You own a restaurant, mission field. You're a student in public high school, mission field. Here's another conversation I have all the time outside after church. Someone will come up to me and say, hey, Carl, I want to introduce you to my friends. It's their first time today. So I'll kind of make some small talk, but I always ask because I want to know, hey, how do you all know each other? You know what the answer is 95% of the time? We work together. Do you know... The dirty little, and my staff sit up front. Uh, do you know the dirty little secret of people who work in church? And it's not just Mosaic, it, it's every church. The dirty little secret of people who work in church is they're jealous of you. Because you get paid to be around non-Christians every day. We're jealous of you. Because that's awesome. You get to wake up every day. You get to walk into meetings. You get to sit in your cubicle. You get to go do your job knowing these, this person who doesn't know Jesus has to be around me. Their boss is making them be around a Christian. God, this is unbelievable. You get to wake up every single day praying, God, thank you that I have to be around non-Christians today. Man, thank you for equipping me to be a missionary. This is awesome. Please bear some fruit over time. And listen, those of us who work in church, who work in other Christian ministries, we know every day is not a nonstop evangelism session. And please don't make it that. <laughs> but they have to be around you. And you're working with character. And you're working with joy. Which means over time, it's an inevitable question of why do you have so much hope and joy? And you'll say, let's sit down, how much time you got? Right? And don't get me wrong, our staff and all church staffs love their job, but we are legit jealous of those of you who get to work in environments like that. Um, I'm not going to talk more about this because we're going to do an entire week in this series about what it means to be a missionary at your job because I know what I just said instantly fired some questions for you. We're going to tackle them. We'll get there. But just know work is the best place for you to say to others, come and see. Last reason work is a gift. Work makes the world better. It's really that simple. When we work, we are joining God in caring for his creation, in continuing the job he gave to Adam of making this world better, of setting things in order. We're living out the Genesis mandate. And that's why it's important to have a job that actually matters. I thought it was kind of funny. Remember when COVID vaccine first came out and looking at the stats, we know the older you are, the, uh, the more susceptible you are to bad effects of COVID, right? So we said, okay, in, in, in Maryland, like old, old people get the vaccine first. And we're like, yes, that makes sense. But then what was the second group, right? It was essential workers, right? You know this? And um, 
it was interesting because I was like, oh, that like sounds right. That makes sense. I want essential workers to get the vaccine first, I guess. Um, but then I started talking to everybody and, and, and then you got the vaccine and you, you got the vaccine, you got the vaccine. And I was like, well, yeah, you're essential. And I started realizing, who's not essential? <laughs> like, did you think about this? And this time, like, who is not essential in our society to do their job? Who got told, your job doesn't matter? <laughs> we'll get to you, maybe, <laughs> right? Think about this. The person who keeps the gas station open is essential because we need to travel places. And the person who checks out my groceries at the store is completely essential. And the truck driver who got the groceries there is unbelievably essential, as is the farmer who grew those things. And then the person who built the farming equipment is essential. And the engineer who designed the farming equipment is essential. And we have to have people keep working at the NSA because I don't want people taking advantage of us while we're like shut down as a country. So they're essential. And teachers are essential because we still have to educate our kids. We can't just say, kids go be stupid right and as I thought about it I couldn't think of a job that wasn't essential I mean I did think of a few I I thought it was interesting that (laughs) no I'm just going to pick on one and you you all have to agree with me on this okay Um, we shut down like uh, we shut down like church but alcohol stores were allowed to stay open (laughs) can I just point out we got that one backwards like, I enjoyed a good old-fashioned, y'all, but I enjoyed Jesus a little bit more. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I do think some of you need to ask, and I don't know who. I'm not thinking of certain people. Um, I-, I think you need to ask, does my job make this world better? And I think for 99% of us, absolutely. But if, if your job, ultimately, when you're really honest and not trying to lie to yourself, If it promotes addiction, laziness, selfishness, uh, lust even, greed, you probably need to switch careers. I'll just leave that at that. It is important to ask, am I making the world better? I heard a, a story of a Christian one time who stood up in a church like this, and he told the story of his career. He said, you know, I used to be an engineer, and that's what I went to school for. I designed bridges. It's like, oh, pretty, pretty cool job. But then he said, I realized all those bridges are going to burn up one day, so I quit that. I went to seminary, and now I share the gospel with people. And he sat down, and the whole church clapped, like, man, that's great. And I love when people go into professional ministry. But that guy gave the impression that unless you do paid church work, that somehow you're not doing everything you could for Jesus. And I just don't think that's true. We need good bridges. We need good bridges to keep access open. We need good bridges so they don't collapse and people die. We need good bridges so the missionary can drive across and take the gospel to other people. Work makes the world better. And we want to help you in two different ways. we got two unique things, one ongoing, one at one time, that we're going to help you with this in addition to the rest of the sermon series. One is, as you figure out what group you want to get in, we have five groups called God at Work. They're all uh, going to go through the same book, but they're going to be a collection of people who are doing the same type of jobs that you can sign up for. One is for military, one is for contractors, one is business professionals, one is for uh, people who work in healthcare, and one is for teachers. So if you're looking for a group to get in, that could be one. Then, in addition, we just thought, even beyond the people who will get in a group, or including that, we wanted to create an environment where you could create, uh, where you could meet people at Mosaic who do similar careers to you and ask questions of how do you follow Jesus in a career like this? So our team has organized two nights, and they're going to be the same, so you can pick one where you can attend. Um, Go ahead and put the website up where you can sign up here and you can attend here at Mosaic one of these and meet other people who are in a job like yours. And there's going to be a little presentation from stage, but a lot of it's just going to be discussion of how you all do that together. So if you've thought, I need some help on following God at work, this is what you want to do, and beyond that, sign up for a group would be good as well. We need to embrace work as a gift. I like that guy, Mike Rowe. Remember him? He used to have that show, Dirty Jobs. And he's a real big advocate for good, old-fashioned hard work. Here's something he said. What's the problem 
We made work the enemy. We talk about millions of shovel rot. Excuse me, <laughs> shovel. Re- learn how to forget. <laughs> I forgot how to read on sabbatical. We talk about millions of shovel-ready jobs for a society that doesn't encourage people to pick up a shovel. We keep lending money we don't have to people who can't pay it back for jobs that don't exist. Bit by bit, our culture reaffirms the misguided belief that a career in the skilled trades shouldn't be desired, and that lack of enthusiasm has reshaped our expectations of a good job into something that no longer resembles work. Now, he is kind of going off on a tinge about blue-collar and white-collar work and how people can look down on some jobs. What I do like is Micro wasn't just talk. He created a nonprofit to promote hard work. And he came up with something called the Micro Sweat Pledge. I won't show you all these. They're all good. You can go look them up. I want to show you a few of them that really line up with Scripture. Number four on his list was, I do not follow my passion. I bring it with me. I believe any job can be done with passion and enthusiasm. Number eight, I believe that the most annoying sounds in the world are whining and complaining. Yes, say the parents. I will not make them. If I am unhappy in my work, I'll either find a new job or find a way to get happy. Number 11, I understand the world is not fair, and I'm okay with that. I do not resent the success of others. You know what that attitude is? Humility. And I love that because that's the same attitude that it takes for you to come to Jesus. Because you know how you get right with God? (laughs) It's not work. And that's what a lot of you have been trying. So I'll just clean this up, stop that, do that, give that, I'll be good with God. He'll just put the things on a scale one day, the good outweigh the bad, I'm in. No. When you sin, you create an uncrossable chasm between you and God because he's holy. But Jesus says, I'll cross that gap. I'll make you holy, not happy, and I'll bring you to heaven with me one day. And if you want to accept that, we want you to check the baptism box on that connection card because we want to talk to you about that this week because the best thing that ever happens here is when one of you comes home. Scripture says God gives different people different talents Abilities, circumstances, opportunities. But he crafts your circumstances for unique reasons so you can find God and impact others. And arguably the biggest impact you ever have is in your work. My first job, I worked in a grocery store. And uh, I was a bag boy, which meant I had two jobs. One was just put the groceries in the bag, keep the bread on top, and don't break the eggs. Pretty simple. And the other was getting the carts. And getting the carts was fine. Let me get some fresh air. But there's those dog days of August where it was so hot, and you come in, you're just covered in sweat. And then there was those rainstorm days where we'd wait till the carts were almost empty and we couldn't wait any longer, and we'd go out there and we'd just be absolutely drenched like we just literally hopped in a shower uh, when we walked back in. And I despised it. Side note, for the sake of 16-year-old cart boys everywhere, please always put your cart back where it belongs. Thank you. But (laughs) I feel you, baby. But it developed character in me. Because there's parts of my job that are real tedious, and sometimes I'll look out the window on a rainy or hot day and think, well, at least I don't have to do, go get carts today. And I provided for those in need because my little $40 a week, a week paycheck, you know, I did, I tithed. So that's part of the great things my church did. And it made the world better because I was helping people eat. And it was a great place to say, come and see, because I'd have conversations with these other teenagers that worked there, and they'd say, why don't you party like we do? And I'd say, I found something better. Work is a gift. So tomorrow morning, when you wake up, and that alarm goes off earlier than you'd like, and you got a day of sitting in a cubicle or running errands or taking care of kids or going to school, view it as a gift from God. Next week, we're going to talk about healthy ambition. God wants you to have healthy ambition. We're going to unpack that. But in the meantime, I'm going to read you one verse that I want to leave you with, then I'll pray, and then we're going to go out and enjoy all this fun stuff 
outside for you and your kids after service. All right, here's the verse. It's a paraphrase of Romans chapter 12. Embrace what God has put before you today as the best thing you could possibly do for him. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love this church. And uh, we need help with work. We do. It's confusing. It's tedious. Sometimes we love it. Sometimes we hate it. Um, Sometimes it feels so separate from, like, the spiritual things in our life. So God, help us walk into tomorrow knowing work's a gift and treat it that way. And help us walk in with a missionary mindset and knowing you're going to develop character and that just as you gave Adam work before sin entered the world, that we too can do something good to share with those in need. We love you, Jesus. Thanks for truth that sets us free. We love it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.